questions? That's PA4. Getting there? Sure. Right, so height of a binary tree we can define recursively. Take the left subtree, take the right subtree, whichever one has the greater height, add one to find the height of the whole thing. Right, because height is just the distance from here to a leaf. If you're in a subtree, the distance from that root to a leaf is one less than the distance from here to the leaf. All right, so find the height of those two sides, and that gives you the maximum height. Did you win? No. Oh. That's really good. All right, so your height function can be written recursively. Put in a base case, if your tree is null, height's minus one, that's a definition. Um, height of the left equals height, tree left. Height right equals height, tree right. And then just return one plus the largest of those two heights. So you almost don't have to write anything. The only math we're doing is right here. Is that how you've been trying to do it, or? Um, I just wasn't sure, just because there could be like a lot of branches, and then there could be like any possibility where the deepest node could be. I wasn't sure how that would, how to like find the deepest node. Right, and this will actually get you there. Because each time that you make this recursive call to tree left, right, the first time you're going to try to find the height of this. And when you do that, the first thing it's going to do is try to find the height of this node, right, a tree containing a single node. And it'll try to find the height of the left subtree, which is null, which will come back minus 1. It'll add 1 and say this has a height of 0. And then it'll come down and do the height of the right subtree, which will do the height of that and null and the height of that and null and this will come up with a height of 0 and 0, so this tree will have a height of 1. And then it'll say, okay, this tree had a height of 0, this tree had a height of 1, this is the biggest, so it'll say this tree has a height of 2. And it'll return from the very first call you made to height tree left with a value of 2. And then it'll do the same thing on the right, and this will have a height of 1. And it'll say, okay, 2 is the biggest, so the height of the original tree was 3. 1, 2, 3. That's your final answer. But it actually goes down and it visits every leaf, every node in, in the process. And you can sort of tell that from algorithms like this in general, because each time you come in, you're going to make two recursive calls. Right? The number of, of calls you're going to make is two, two, however many times you're going to call this, which is, again, basically the height. Did my responses about delete make sense? Not really. Not really? Um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely magic. Okay. 
So, um, and these are both root. And this is data. So if the first thing you're doing is deleting the root of the tree, that's fine, right? We know the algorithm for that. If you're recursing and deleting something other than the actual root, right, like say we're trying to delete the seven, this is going to keep traveling down the tree, right? Seven smaller than 20, so it's going to make a recursive call that says delete seven from this. That shouldn't be. Mm. Okay, that's by the tree. So we're trying to delete seven. It's going to make a recursive call that says delete seven from this tree. Seven's bigger than the root. It's going to make a second recursive call that says delete seven from this tree. That's going to happen with the stuff that we do, mm -hmm. right? Um, that last recursive call we made said temp equals delete root arrow right comma seven. Okay, so it calls delete, it removes seven from here, which turns us into, you know, this, this simpler tree. And when we return from that call to delete, right, the call was, was temp equals delete root arrow right. So it makes temp equal to um, this. And then it says root arrow right equals 10, right? We were working with this tree, so the right child becomes this. And that was a recursive call up here where we deleted from the left, so when we get back from that, all of this is temp. And then it says root arrow left equals temp, so now, right, 20 points to the five, the three, the six, the eight. So that's what I mean by like, hooks everything back up on the way out of the recursion. Yeah, for whatever reason, when I was actually writing my delete function, I forget that delete returns something. So yeah, I'm yeah. Using it as if it was void. Right, like and that, that will definitely not work yeah. unless you're doing the root. <laughs> right, so yeah, if you're deleting from the right, set root right equal to what delete returns. Okay, and it's exactly the same thing for add. Yeah. Right, when you're inserting into a tree, um, you got to set root right equal the result of insert, or root left equals the result of insert. kind of deleting part of the tree, make sure that when you call delete, you assign the return value to root arrow left or root arrow right or root. So this thing, if, if you're deleting the root, right, do whatever you have to do and return the new root. If you're deleting something from the left subtree, make sure you, you set the left subtree to what delete gave you back. And that's usually where you lose half the trees if you don't do that. Okay. And if that doesn't lead you to the answer, try to find the smallest test case you can that shows the problem. And then you can go through it with GDB and see where things break apart. But if it does it with like three nodes, that's a lot easier than like 10 nodes. <laughs> All right, anything else? So I'm talk about queues. And we talked about stacks a while ago. Stacks were last in, first out data structures. Queues are first in, first out data structures. So they're very similar to stacks. Um, but they behave differently in one fundamental way. And I want to talk about these because they're useful on their own, but then I want to talk about stacks and queues with respect to tree traversal. 
and then with respect to other recursive algorithms. Um, so we'll do this for a day or two, and then we'll we'll come back and talk about balancing trees. Um, but let's let's forget about trees for a few moments, and let's just think about this new data structure called a queue. So a stack, right? Remember stack of plates at the buffet, take one off the top, put one on the top, right? Last one that goes into the stack is the first thing that comes out, push and pop, okay? A queue is a different beast. It's a first in, first out. And so it's modeled on, you know, a queue as in a line that people stand in. Um, and so think of, you know, um, a what? Yeah, a grocery store. So here's, here's where you pay your money and get your groceries bagged. And you come in to the back of the line, and you work your way through to the front. And when you get to the front, you get to pay for your groceries, and they bag them up, and you can leave. Okay. So person A comes up, and the queue is empty. And so person A is sitting here at the head of the queue. We call this end the tail of the queue. So they're ringing up person A's groceries, and two more people show up, person B and person C, and they queue up like that. Okay. Person C is the last person who got added to the queue. They're the last person who's going to be taken care of. Okay. The first person who came in behind A is B. They're the first person to be taken care of after A. So person A finishes. They get their groceries. They leave. And now B moves up to the head of the queue. And C moves up right behind them. And now a bunch more people show up, D, E, and F. Right? F is the last person who's going to be serviced. So it's first in, first out. Okay, fundamentally different from a stack. A stack, F was the last one in, they'd be the first one out. A queue is one direction. You go in the tail, you come out the head. Okay, and these, these are mostly standardized terms. I'll use these terms always in this class. Tail is where you insert, head is where you remove. All right, so why is this useful? It's useful for storing things away and then taking them out in the same order in which you stored them. Okay, for example, at a grocery store, right? It's very annoying if you're in a big long line and the last person who comes into the line way behind you suddenly is the first person that's taken care of. Okay, that's not efficient. And there's a chance that the people in the front of the line will never get serviced that way. Right, because the people coming in the back come out, right? So a stack would be a horrible way to service customers at a grocery store. Um, a queue is sort of the natural way to do it. And so what do we do that's like servicing customers when we have an operating system, we process jobs. So you look at your, your system and there's, you know, a few hundred jobs out there. I got 286 tasks sitting on my system. Most of them are sleeping. Um, but they wake up periodically for brief periods of time. Um, and when they wake up, they need the attention of the CPU. So you have you know, process A and process B and process C. Each want a piece of the CPU's time. So at the head of the queue, the operating system finds process A, it takes it, it loads it into memory, it lets it run on the CPU for a while. After 10 milliseconds, some quanta of time, it says, okay, you've had enough time, it takes A out of the active state and it puts it into the back of the queue. And it takes what's at the head of the queue now, which is B, and it starts running process B for a little period of time. And when that period of time is up, it takes B and it throws it in the back of the queue and it takes the new head of the queue, which is C, and starts to execute that. And when that time is up, it goes back into the back of the queue and now it's A's turn again. So you have this round robin process scheduling. And, you know, maybe while job A is running, job D comes along and wants to be executed. So D goes in the back of the queue. When A's time is up, it'll go in the back of the queue while it's behind D now. Okay, and B starts executing and maybe B finishes, it completes and returns from its main program, it doesn't go back into the queue, right? And so now C gets pulled out, gets a slice of time, goes into the back. And so this is a way you can process jobs, right? Because one of the main things the operating system does, finds the next job that needs time, 
allocates some time to it, lets it run for a while, and then picks it up and tucks it away in the back of the process queue. And you can have queues with different priorities. We could have a low priority queue for user jobs and a high priority queue for system jobs. Because you know when a packet comes in from the internet, that has to be dealt with pretty quickly. Because there's probably more stuff coming in behind it. When I'm typing on my keyboard, if it waits, you know, 20 milliseconds before it processes my keystroke, it doesn't make any difference. I don't type that fast. So you could have jobs in a low priority queue and in a high priority queue, and the deal might be, you know, if there's anything in the high priority queue, that gets precedence. Or every time we process three jobs from the high priority queue, we'll process one from the low priority. Right? Some systems have 32 different priority levels for jobs. So you can, you can do all kinds of things with job scheduling and stuff, but it's mostly based on this, this common data structure of a queue. All right, got the idea of, of how data flows in there. So as an abstract data type, what do we have? We have some sort of initialize to get things going. We have an insert, which says push this into the back of the queue, the tail. We have a remove, which lets us remove something. And that's probably all we really need. So insert something into the queue, remove something from the queue. With two exceptional conditions to note, um, when we try to remove something from the queue, it's possible the queue is empty. And when we try to insert something into the queue, it's possible the queue is full. So we need a way to either test those or have those reported to us after we try to insert or remove. And you know, with, with a job scheduling example, we don't have any way to know ahead of time if the queue is empty. Because you know, one piece of the system is putting things into the queue and another piece is taking things out. And it's, it's not like push and pop where these are usually done in pairs, right? You might have totally separate things, putting things into the queue, taking things out of the queue. So it's, it's very plausible that we might find the queue is empty and need to do something other than just throw up. Um, so we want some kind of tests for that. So if we draw a queue and we want to insert a few things A, B, C, right, they look like that. When A gets removed from the queue, what do we really want to do? Well, we really want to show that B is at the head of the queue, so we move B up and we move C up. And maybe A goes back in and D and E go in. And now when B gets removed from the queue, right, we'd really like to move these things over so that we have C and A and D and E, right, and C is sitting at the head of the queue. And that's a horrible way to implement a queue because you're moving a lot of stuff around. So just like with a stack, Instead of having the top of the stack always be, say, the beginning of the array and moving things up and down, we can move where the head of the queue is and actually keep the data stationary in memory. So if we're implementing queues with an array, we do something similar to what we did with a stack. We have a head and a tail, and we need two pointers now. Because right, there's two ends of the queue that we're interested in. The tail where we insert and the head where we remove. And we just move those around. So if we insert an A, we'll change the tail to point to this next location. And we insert a B, we'll change the tail to here, and we'll insert a C. We'll change the tail to here. So what does our queue look like right now? It has three things in it, and if we say remove the head of the queue, we're going to pick up the A. And we're going to change the head in the same direction, so that the next time we say remove, we'll remove the B. And if we remove the B, then we'll move the head again, and the next time we say remove, we'll remove the C. 
Now if we add a D and an E and an F, right, then our, our tail moves accordingly. And let's remove the C. So right now our Q has three things in it. D, E, and F. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you move the head when you do a remove, you move the tail when you do an insert. All right, because tail says where should you put the next item in, head says where should you remove the next item from. So they have to be independent. Yeah. So I see in conventions that it'll just kind of crawl down and eventually you'll hit the end of the room. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, will you do it, is it a good idea to like check it every time and see if you need to just take everything and slide it back? Yes, it's good to check if you're at the end, but you don't have to slide everything back. So here's what can happen. Let's go ahead and insert a G. And the tail moves to here. And let's insert an H. Okay, there's nothing left over here in the array to, to use, but these three spots are unused. So we roll over and we move the tail back to this first spot. Yeah, and now if I insert an I, that goes right here, and the tail moves to the second spot. We don't need one, it turns out. So here's the thing, if we start removing, we're going to remove the D, the E, the F, the G, the H. We're going to wrap around and remove the I. The head will come here, and when the head and tail are equal, we know the Q is empty. So the trick is, and I'm, I'm assuming that, that we're indexing from like right to left, just because that's what I did. All right, so eight elements in our array. So when you insert, we store at the value that the tail is pointing to, we increment the tail, and if it's bigger than the size of the array, we roll it back to zero. And when we remove, we do exactly the same thing. We remove the element pointed to by the head, we increment the head, and if it's bigger than the size of the array, we roll it back to zero. So if we want to code this, it's really not too bad. It's just a little um, error prone. So let's let's do a queue of uh, integers. Can you instead of using an array, just malloc space and then free when you're done? Um, like you can. Um, and you could use that in particular if you wanted to be able to grow the queue yeah. if, if it needed to get bigger while you're running. Um, but if you have a reasonable idea how big it should be, you can just statically allocate to. Right. So that fear, be more efficient to like it depends what you're trying to do. I mean, if you need to be able to grow it, you're, you're going to have to, you know, allocate array space at runtime. Okay. So you'll do something with a malloc. So, so if we have an integer array called Q and we just say it's size is size, so 8 for example, in this case. And we need two pointers. Okay, remember tail is where we insert, head is where we remove. So to initialize, we can set them both equal to zero. It turns out we can set them both equal to anything. As long as they're equal, that'll mean the queue's empty. So insert an element n. Well, you insert at the place the tail is pointing to. So you say something like q bracket n, q bracket tail equals n, and then tail equals increment tail modulo size.
That's your whole insert. So if our tail is equal to one right now and we want to store uh, J, right, we'll store J at Q bracket one, which is right here. And we'll increment tail to two. So point two, index element two. And if it gets to, you know, where it's pointing to the H and we increment it, so it's an eight, which is um, the same as a size. When we do modulo size, it'll go back to a zero. And our remove routine, um, so read what's at the position pointed to by the head. That's the value we're going to return. And then increment the head, roll it over based on the Q size, and then return that value that you read. Yeah? So why do we have to mod Because if we just keep increasing the tail, eventually it'll get bigger than the size of the array. So can we just do like... You could do an if. F2. Yeah, you could say if it's equal to the size of the array, then set it equal to zero. Okay. So our is empty function is one line, just return whether or not the head and tail are equal. And then the full detection is strange. So let's say this is the head. So we put in an A and a B and a C and a D and an E and this is the tail. So usually what we do is we say right now the queue is full. Even though there's one more spot in there, the problem is if we insert something into this spot, the tail and the head are going to be equal, and that's also what happens when the queue is empty. So we usually just blow one spot, say we can't completely fill up the array, and we'll detect the queue is full when tail plus one equals head. So is full, return if tail plus one, bless you, modulo size equals head. And that picks up that case. So it's, it's not a lot of code. To, to implement a queue with an array. It's very efficient, right? We're, we're not moving anything around in memory. We're just changing where we store or where we read from. You need two pointers, but that's not a big deal. Um, but your array does have a fixed size. If our array is eight and we try to push seven or eight things into our queue, um, we'll end up saying the queue is full. So what's the other way we can implement a queue without using an array? Link list. Link list, all right? Just like we used a link list for a stack. So for a stack, we had our list. When we wanted to push, we just put something into the beginning. When we wanted to pop, we just removed the first thing. And that's very efficient. We never have to move around to get to the end. So with a queue, you just insert at one end and remove from the other. So if that's our queue, if we insert, we can add something to the end. If we want to remove, we just remove the first element. And this looks like insert could be order n, but we can make it order 1. We can just have an end the list variable that always points to the last node. When you want to insert, what do you do? You make a new node, you change end of list next to point to your new node, and you change end of list to point to your new node.
and it doesn't matter how much stuff is back here, you can always get to the end of the list and just tack on another node. And if you want to remove, you just return the first node and you change your sentinel to point to where the first node was pointing. So it's order one to, to insert or remove from a queue like this. That only really works if you insert at the end. If you remove from the end and insert at the beginning, removal is harder to do because you have to back up. So these are all details I spared you from by not having you do a queue in, in PA4. So different ways to implement queues. But the behavior is the same as an abstract data type. Basically, you insert and you remove. And the last thing that you insert it will be the last thing that you remove. The first thing you insert will be the first thing you remove. Why would we use the queue in PA4? Is that for like a thread first? Exactly. Yeah, that's where we're going. <laughs> All right, so questions on this? So like are the stacks as an error prone as queues or are they less error prone? Uh, I don't think either of them is particularly error prone. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking of? Because I know earlier you said that um, queues can be a little error prone, so I was wondering if like, that would also apply to you. Oh, um, what I meant was that in coding them up, it can be, there's more things you have to deal with. Yeah. Mainly this business of rolling over the pointers and knowing when it's full, even mm -hmm. though there's one spot left. Right. It's just a little, you just have to code it up just right. Mm -hmm. Stacks don't have the same level of nuance. So yeah, but but it's not hard to do once once you get it lined up. All right. So what do we use cues for um, with trees? We can use them for traversal. So let's make a tree. And the traversals we were working with, left node, right, and so on, are what we call depth first traversals. They tend to go down very deep before they move across, right? Because we're generally printing leaf nodes and then the immediate parents of leaves and the parents of those and working our way up to the root. And so in, in our in order traversal, left node, right, the root node comes out about halfway through the traversal if everything's nicely balanced, right? We're gonna do all of this stuff on the left, which means we're gonna do all of this and then all of that, which means we'll do all of that and all of that before we do that, before we do that, before we do the 20, right? So it's, it's depth first. We move down the tree more than we move across. We don't move to the right side of the tree until we've done everything on the left, which means we've gone all the way down to all the leaf nodes on the left subtree. And then we did the node, and then we start doing things in the right subtree. Okay, there's an alternative to depth first, which is breadth first. And breadth first would basically print out everything at a depth of zero, <coughs> and then everything at a depth of one, and then everything at a depth of two, three, and four. So it would give you your data in the order that you get by sweeping across and slowly moving down only after you've gone all the way from left to right on each level. So we come down here, we do the 5, 12, 35, we've gone all the way across the breadth of the tree at that level, then we go down a little deeper. Okay, and there's always these two ways to do two-dimensional objects. Go down and across, or go across and down. So this is breadth first. Well, how do we do breadth first traversal? It turns out it's pretty easy with a queue. So here's an algorithm. Insert the root into the queue. That's a one-time start the whole process kind of thing. Here's our main loop. Remove the root. If there's nothing in the queue to remove, you're done.
I'll make up the first step. If there's nothing in the queue, then you're done. Otherwise, um, R equals remove the root. Print R and then insert R left, insert R right, and then go back up here. So we start the whole process by just inserting the root into the queue. And then we loop. As long as there's something in the queue, remove it, print it, insert its left and right children into the tail of the queue. So let's see what this does. So we seed the whole process by inserting a 20 into the tail of the queue. All right, so first thing we do is we remove the root and we print it. That's a 20. And then we push the left and right children into the queue. So we push in a 10 and a 30. And then we go back up to the top. The queue is not empty, so we remove the head of the queue, which is a 10, and we print that out. That comes out of the queue, and we insert the left and right children of 10. That's a 5 and a 12. Go back up to the top. The queue's not empty. Remove the root node, the head of the queue, which is 30. Print that out, and then insert the left child, which doesn't exist, so there's nothing to insert, and the right child, which is 35. Okay, so our queue contains 35, 12, and 5 now. And you can see what's happening. Well, let me remove the 5, print it out, insert the left and right children while the left and right children are in all, so there's nothing to insert. Okay, we're going to remove the 12, and we're going to print that. And then we're going to insert the left and right children into the back of the queue. Right? We already have a 35 queued up. That's the thing that comes after 12 on this level. And that's going to pop out of the queue before we get to the things that we're about to insert, which are the children, which means they're on the next level. Right? And when we pop out the 35, we're going to push its child out of the queue, and it's going to go in behind the 11 and the 14. So each time we go through this loop, we're removing one thing from the head of the queue, and we're pushing its children at the back of the queue, right, behind everything else that's going to get printed, which is going to be the stuff at the same level as the node we're on right now. So we pop off the 12, we push in its 11 and 14. I'm running out of, I'm gonna shift my queue, 35, 11, 14. Right, so we print the 35, that comes out of the queue, we push its children, which are 34. We pop off the 11, print it out, it has no children. We pop off the 14. We print that out, we push its left child doesn't exist, its right child is 15. We pop off the 34, it has no children, we pop off the 15. And then when we come up here, there's nothing left in the queue, we're done. And we traverse the tree, there's a 20 at the first level, 10 and 30. 5, 12, 35, 11, 14, 34, and 15. Uh, you don't have to do this recursively. This can be a while loop. But if you did it recursively, you need to have a way to keep that queue accessible. Yeah, you'd need to outside pass it around or, yeah, probably have it outside. But there's usually no reason to recurse for this. And in fact, I don't think recursion works very well at all, because you know if we're if we're at this point, we can't say do a breadth first traversal of this subtree, right? Because that's not going to give us the right order. 
we really need to make sure we come over here and then go down and you know the thing we're trying to do a BFS on is not a tree once we move down one level and recursion is fundamentally stack based right because that's the nature of calls so you'd really be fighting it, so you'd really be fighting it yeah which yeah right? yeah which is just a while loop in some ways yeah but it's a really fancy loop that remembers everything you were doing yeah. so when you're done with the loop you can like get back to a previous state okay. that's, that's, that's sort of the magic of it so this gives us a breadth first traversal of a tree um, and it's using a queue we can do something similar using a stack and we don't usually do this but we can so let me give you a stack based traversal algorithm um, step one push the root onto the stack step two um, if left child exists push and repeat step two. Step three, pop and print. Step four, um, if right exists, if right child exists, push and go to step two. Otherwise, go to step three. And when we pop and print, if you can't, then you're done. So let's let's make a tree. And let's make a stack. And let's look at what this thing will output. So we start off by pushing the root onto the stack. So my stack's going to grow in this direction. So we'll push a 10 onto the stack. If there's a left child, push it and go to step 2. There's a left child, which is 5. We'll push that on the stack. Go back to step 2. If there's a left child of 5, push it. There is. That's a 3. If there's a left child of 3, push it while there isn't. So we come down to step 3. Pop off the top of the stack and print it. So we output a 3. And then if a right child exists, push that and go back to step 2. So, um, so 3 does not have a right child. So we go back to step 3, pop off the top of the stack and print it. So that's a 5. And then if 5 has a right child, push it onto the stack. Well, 5 does have a right child, it's 7. So we'll push that on the stack and go up to 2. If 7 has a left child, push it onto the stack. Well, it does, so we push a 6, and we go back to step 2. 6 does not have a left child, go down to step 3, pop the top of the stack, and print it. And then if there is a right child, 6 does not have a right child, so we don't do that, so we go back to step 3. Pop the top of the stack is a 7. If it has a right child, it does not. So we go back to step 3, which says pop the top of the stack, which is the 10. The stack's empty right now, that's okay. If there's a right child, push it. There is a right child to 10, that's a 20, so we push that onto the stack, we go back to 2. Does not have a left child, so we pop the top of the stack is a 20, and we print it. And if it has a right child, push it on the stack, that's a 40. Go back to step 2, no left child, pop it, and print. If it has a right child, push it, it doesn't. So we go back to step three, we try to pop the stack, the stack's empty, we're done. Okay, this is your left node right traversal. So I did that pretty fast, okay, but the point is using a stack and something that looks kind of like what we did with the queue, we can traverse this tree, but we do it in this depth first, left node right in this case. And depending on where I put the pop and print, we can get the other traversal orders that we've been working with. 
But what I want you to realize from this is that there's this, this fundamental two ways, depth first and breadth first. Depth first is usually stack based, breadth first is usually queue based. And this comes up in lots of situations, okay? When you're, you're going through web pages, right? Um, we talked about this with stacks. You see something interesting, you click on it, it takes you to another page. You start reading that, you see an interesting link, you click on that, it takes you to another page, right? You're building up a stack. When you're done with this page and you hit the back button, you go back to the last place you were when you clicked a link and you continue reading from there, okay? That's a depth first way to get distracted on the web. We could do it in a breadth first way. You could read a page and you see three interesting links and you write them down on paper, but you finish reading the whole page you're on. And then you go back and you click on that first link and you start reading that and you see some interesting links on that second page, but you write them down. You finish that second page, you go back to the first page, you click on that second link that you wrote down. That takes you over here, you're reading about some sports game, there's interesting things you wanna click on there, you note those, but you finish the page Come back to that first page, click on the third thing, okay? This is breadth first. You're reading all of the pages that were one level removed before you start following any of those links down to a second level. Okay, most people don't do that. Most people just follow the links and you just click and click and click and you get deeper and deeper in your stack. And then you have the handy back button that just brings you back to the last place you were and you can pop your way out like that. So think about um, when you're trying to solve a maze, right? You start at the beginning and you start following through and you get to a place where you can go left or right and you have to decide which way to go. Think about that, whether you're using a stack or a queue and let's start from there tomorrow. And there's, there's multiple answers for that. All right, so I'll see you next time.